Yes, PASTA does adapt. Uh, Kelly Uyoka, he's the chief executive president of, uh, of PAXA, and um, we're talking about uh, Think Tech Tech Talks this morning here at the 11 o'clock block on a given Tuesday with Kelly. Welcome to the show, Kelly. Hi, Jay. Thanks for having me. Happy to PAXA, be here. PAXA is a, an important company. It's a local company. It's a subsidiary of a local company. It's really all local, even though I read that uh, you somehow wangled your brother into coming back. Uh, after a hiatus on the mainland. <laughs> yeah. And now the, the family is back together in Hawaii. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So anyway, so, uh, you, you know, you've had an interesting career um, and you wound up in a place where a lot of people would envy you, uh, Paxa. Uh, is it, it, has, it has presented itself as the largest IT uh, company in the state, local company anyway. Is it? Is it still? Yes, I believe so. Yeah. Still the largest systems integrator um, locally based to, to the state of Hawaii. That's great. And you represent uh, what medium and also large local companies and probably Actually, l large national companies, huh? Yeah, yeah. I mean, we we represent small, mid-sized, large enterprise, you know, state government, Department of Defense, um, et cetera. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, that we, we need that. We need to have an industry um, of companies that have, you know, the sophistication and the knowledge base uh, to represent companies of all sizes, you know, especially now, because uh, you talk about uh, defense, um, you know, now is a time when the Department of Defense is focusing more resources as it should uh, in Hawaii. <clears throat> and so we need to be able to assist them with local companies and contractors. And they're trying to help us do that, um, but we have to push back. We have to uh, develop our own expertise is really important. Yeah, absolutely right, Jay, absolutely correct. So anyway, uh, I, wanted, I wanted to talk about COVID with you because COVID affected everybody. And, and um, you know, it's funny, COVID affected the, the technology industry in a pretty profound way. Uh, it wasn't all bad. It was like all of a sudden you could see clearly. All of a sudden you could see what you were missing. You could see what you needed to do. Um, you could continue to operate, but you had to change the way you were operating. Uh, and you could, uh, you could develop new systems, find new creativity. That's, that's what I have heard. And, and I'll tell you the truth. That's what we have experienced at ThinkTech. We learned so much. And a lot of those lessons are permanent lessons. So tell us about the PAXA experience with COVID, Kelly. Sure. So, you know, PAXA as a systems integrator focused on, um, you know, digital transformation and um, remote work kind of falls into that paradigm a lot of times. Um, you've heard of the concept of a VPN, right? A virtual private network where any people can work securely from anywhere. And COVID just really... Um, pushed a lot of organizations um, to the forefront of adopting, you know, full-blown remote work. I mean, literally working from anywhere available 24-7. And, um, you know, PAXA had, ha has a lot of experience in that arena. And we saw that, you know, some of the larger organizations, and a credit to them, um, they had made investments in these types of technology years ago and um, probably brought the systems to capacity, but not exceeding uh, capacity. So it really did work and help push the workforce forward, I think, um, you know, by being able to adopt remote work. And now, I mean, you know, one of the key thing, I mean, absolute paramount, um, you know, topics in IT is cybersecurity because it's become so easy for you know these bad actors or quote unquote the bad guys to compromise systems you know to pose as other uh, even directors or senior executives inside of companies and have money wired out etc so you know to do this securely really was the challenge uh, for paxa and the, the partners and customers that we serve that's interesting um so you 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 get onto virtual and then you find that virtual has its own challenges, not only, you know, historically, but now worse and worse every day. I mean, I, you know, it shook me that I saw an article recently about how 
um, you know, we have more ransomware, we have more hacking, uh, we have more cyber attacks now than ever before, and the rate of increase is, is higher than ever before. And, you know, nobody knows where that goes. And you're in a position where, you know, you have, you have two competing elements. One is um, your customers look to you to protect them. Sure, they, you know, that's natural. But the second is uh, you have more to protect them against. Uh, yeah. it's a real challenge yeah yeah absolutely and so when you think about it and you allow people to work from home in you know a myriad of different ways right i mean you could have a different device connected to your home network versus the you know quote unquote corporate or company issued devices that are secured via you know some fairly stringent security policies um it's a totally different it's a totally different uh, ball game at that point. And, um, you know, protecting these uh, consumer grade devices that are connected to networks, you know, that are fairly unsecure, you know, we're using consumer grade devices to provide our internet access. And a lot of that, you know, has to happen um, before you can even work remotely. I mean, if it doesn't pass certain security checks, you know, companies won't, won't even let you access corporate resources. So there is a lot that goes into, you know, enabling remote work just for one person when you think about it. Well, we, we, we have that experience too. I mean, we connect for our shows uh, by Zoom. That's, mm -hmm. our, that's our connection program. We have other op options, but that's the one we use. Mm -hmm. And um, some people, including guests and hosts, um, um, not, not like you, because you're an IT, you know, expert, but... <laughs> A lot of people are not IT experts, and and they have spent a dollar half on their equipment, um, and it, you know it's a it's a combination of of things where it doesn't work. You know, video fails, the audio fails, and of course it's not it's not um, you know secure. We don't actually care much about security, but we care about um, you know broadband, and we care about video and audio, and so we find that a lot of our guests have no clue on how to do it or even how to take instructions on it. Um, and you must have the same problem. Do you ever tell them, look, you got to get a better machine. Look, you got to learn about this program or that program and you yeah. have to change your ways. Do you ever tell them that? Yeah, all the time. And, and you know what, in the past, I mean, prior to COVID, you know, traditionally we would want to take the headache out of, you know, having to explain technologies, having end users have to learn you know, the, the modern way um, of using these, these more modern technologies. But uh, that said, now it's unavoidable. We have to train everybody that's connecting to a corporate or business system because the attacks have gotten so sophisticated and so simple um, that it's impossible to ignore. Also, it's even difficult for us at times when there has been a compromise um, you know, these quote unquote, again, bad guys have gotten so good at covering their tracks that it makes it hard for us um, as, a, as a provider to find out exactly what happened. And by that time, you know, it's damage done, right? I mean, by the time they're coming to us saying that, or our customers coming to us saying that there's been a breach or that, hey, somebody asked me to wire, you know, 100K out of this out of our bank account to pay somebody and we find out that's that was fraudulent it's it's a little too late and so our mission really has been to prevent those types of events from happening i don't know why but that reminds me of the situation where um the guy probably in a red state uh probably a member of the gop uh, he's on he's, he's in a hospital ward he's dying of covid and he says to the doctor can you give me a vaccine I, re I, I changed my mind. I will now take a vaccine. <laughs> well, and the doctor says, too late for you, buddy. <laughs> that, that's, that's very interesting because, uh, you know, a lot of times to shore up or, or, you know, to secure these legacy IT systems, it comes at a fairly high cost. And the industry shifted towards a different model now, very much so uh, pay per use. So you pay as you go. You don't for everything up front anymore kind of like how consumers you know get services like netflix and espn plus etc so the it industry is headed that way and i think it's made it a little bit more palatable but also still 
a lot of education to your point about how to acquire systems and then secure secure said systems. So, um, uh, and if anything I ask you is, is, a, is a problem for you in answering, just tell me you can't. Um, but, you know, have any of your clients, have, have any of your clients had ransomware demands made on them? And what has happened in those scenarios? Oh, I, I mean, absolutely. I mean, it's, um, you know, again, traditionally, our response was to pay the ransom. Because some of these things, again, were so sophisticated. Um, and then again, the immaturity um, on, you know, uh, on some of our partners um, not investing in technology um, caused the ransomware to just completely overtake their entire network. I mean, it's happened to my family, it's happened to you know my friends, and my advice traditionally has been to pay the ransom. Um, now it's a little bit more dire because you could pay the ransom, and then you know again the bad guys will say. Well, we'll give you some of your information back, but if you want that other stuff, you gotta pay us another ransom. Mm -hmm. And so again, our mission really is to prevent those types of events from happening, especially to, you know, of course, to Paxos customers, we're making a foremost effort to prevent those types of things from happening. Well, once the ransom, uh, you know, transaction happens, if you will, <clears throat> then there's, a matter of um, doing damage control going forward. In other words, setting things up uh, better protected. Um, so what kinds of, you know, again, if you can't discuss this because it's confidential or proprietary or anything, mm -hmm. just tell me, but sure. what, what do you tell your client who's just had to pay a ransom uh, to do to prevent that from happening a second time? Yeah, so there's a, a, a myriad of technologies now to prevent against ransomware and you know paxa has uh three very close partners microsoft is one of them and you know microsoft has made a concerted effort to really i mean the world the, especially the corporate world you know runs on windows and it's kind of it's it's kind of good and kind of bad because you know when it when it goes unchecked these types of event events are you know fairly um common and so we tell them hey there's a bunch of tools that you could acquire and of course paxa has the expertise to help implement monitor and maintain the platforms so that when there's a suspicious event perhaps not a full-blown ransomware or a full-blown email compromise paxa has automation behind it where we're watching and we probably know before anybody else um, that there's a suspicious event and that we need action taken. Ah, wow, scary. On the other hand, um, you know, I would suppose that IT companies like yours will proliferate in the years to come because what else can the customer do? He's not going to be able to solve this problem himself. He'd be reading books all day. Um, Precisely. Precisely. He has to rely on an expert. And so the experts, uh, you know, take a larger role just as the black hats do. Mm -hmm. It's a it's a, a spiral, but the customer is in the middle of it. He can't prevent being in the middle of it now. Yeah, precisely. Well, so I, I want to talk about the other thing that's happened recently. I don't know if it affects your wheelhouse, but uh, we have Pegasus from NSO in Israel, uh, mm -hmm. which has which went to uh, which was intended to go to governments, and somehow it leaked out and it got into you know, the environment. And uh, now apparently everybody in the world has it. You can get it if you really want to. And uh, you can hack uh, anyone's phone in the world uh, by, by a, a silent, no-click uh, uh, trap <laughs> yeah. door in everybody's phone. So how is that affecting things? How is it affecting, for example, virtual communication through cell phones? Yeah, I mean, I always say that, you know, if if these black hats really wanted to to hack someone or an organization or something that you you would see a lot of suspicious activity um, ahead of time. But to your point, Jay, you know, for the consumer, I mean, they would have no idea. And so it has affected us in di different ways. I mean, our, our, I guess our paranoia, so to speak, you know, in terms of monitoring systems, monitoring communication 
is just at a at a fever pitch. I mean, it's at an all time high. You know, cybersecurity, a lot of it is predicated on trust, and um, these days we treat everything, and I want to say almost everyone as untrusted. Um, you know, even your phone. I, I remember an expert on surveillance. You know, talking about. Uh, mobile phones and the only way to have it be useful is to rip out the camera and microphone <laughs> and, and so, you know, yeah, that the phone for, is gone take, take, take that for what it's worth but I, I i honestly believe that yeah if there was you know really these targeted attacks it's easier than than we think and to your point if you wanted to get a hold of these you know dangerous tools um, you could. It's, it's fairly readily accessible. And Paxa is extensively testing against those types of attacks. And so, yes, we do have, you know, kind of like a lab where we're able to segregate off and test how these things would actually happen. And I will say, uh, you know, if you're an IT, if you're an IT pro, um, you, you would be able to do it. And you would also be able to find instructions on how to do it. <laughs> yeah, uh, these are very difficult times. That's just one of so many difficulties we face these days. So, uh, but that you know that does uh, offer to me a, a question, and and that is um, you know in the modern in the modern time for an IT professional company like yours, you, you stand in between the customer and the cloud. Mm. Um, and that's that's different than it was like 10, 15 years ago, I think. Oh, yeah. Um, and so um, you yourself, that is Paxa, you, you could be the target of something. You could be the one they look for because um, they, you know, the, you're a fertile ground. If they can get inside of Paxa, they can get inside of your clients. So, mm, you know, query, uh, am I right about that? And and you have to be as hard or harder than your clientele. Yeah. So have you have you been making yourself harder? And has, uh, has COVID affected that in any way? Absolutely. So security hardening is number one uh, for PAXA anytime we engage. And like you make a good point about us being the intermediary between our partners and customers and the cloud. You know, going to cloud doesn't mean that'll solve all security problems, you know, immediately. It actually brings up, it actually raises a lot more challenges and, and concerns um, in terms of now securing the data that you put into cloud and then also uh, controlling data from leaking out of cloud. So yes, we it, it's a good point. We are um, sometimes a target. Um, and like you said, our security hardening, our policies, um, you know, our partners are providing us with the technology to keep our, our ourselves and our customer information safe. Yeah, one thing inherent in, in that uh, point is that um, people may think that the cloud is invulnerable. And then you put your data on the cloud, no problem. It's somehow it's protected. It's not true, is it? Absolutely not true. And so it requires a lot of expertise to then you know, secure the data that's been migrated to cloud. And one of the examples I bring up all the time is email. Um, you know, uh, consumer grade email has been readily available, I wanna say for the last, what, 25 years, 30 years um, in a hosted capacity and very similar to cloud. However, I, you know, I don't think of cloud as a, as a place, I, I suppose. I think about it as a new operating model. So customers will definitely still continue to have systems that run on premises, but also have systems running in the cloud. And that brings up so many more challenges because for, especially for Hawaii, our entryway to, to the cloud is the public internet. And, you know, when you think about it, the public internet is the most unsecured place in, in terms of, you know, transmitting data in this day and age. So the end systems have to be very, very, very secure. Um, and that, that's kind of what, you know, again, our mission has been to secure said systems, whether they're on premises or in the cloud. 
If only we could go back to a kind of closed system in your office, never connects with the internet. You have a server in your office and you have this network that's only only among the machines there. It, you'd probably go out of business pretty soon for the lack of functionality, but, but, but it is very, very secure. <laughs> correct, correct. And that's the, you know, that's the challenge, finding the balance between security and function. Yeah. Well, I want to I want to uh, go to one other thing. It's kind of the, uh, you know, the title of our show is how COVID changed you, and um, I guess uh, let me let me start this way. You know, um, Hawaii, including the Hawaii state government, uh, was really behind. I think on um, business communications, video business communications, call it Zoom, um, and uh, you know all the other program, WebEx, whatnot. And um, what, what happened, at least as far as I know, is that in the business community, all of a sudden everybody woke up last spring, decided, well, we're not gonna be able to get together. That's terrifying. Um, so we really have to, we have to find a way to use uh, Zoom or the others. And we did, and with, with us, it was a, a leveraged situation because uh, we, could, we could do our shows just like this um, without standing up and without using our studio for the actual appearances. Um, but clearly, and, and from you know, our exchange of email before the show, clearly this applies to everyone. And, and business has changed and so has the IT business has changed. Um, and clearly, you know, when and how did this roll, roll in for you? And how have you implemented it? And uh, what are you using, if you can tell me? And Furthermore, how permanent is it? Yeah, sure. So again, as as a you know um, a strong Microsoft partner here in the islands, um, Microsoft now has a collaboration platform called Teams that provides um, you know businesses and enterprises with kind of like the security platform to you know push forward your remote collaboration strategy. And that's, you know, from, it's very similar to Zoom in terms of, you know, audio video, but then also the ability to share documents, share files and, and create applications inside of a single platform is very useful. And it allows people to work remotely. Um, basically, you know, I mean, it's almost like you're in the office without being in the office. And these companies, you know, Microsoft, Google, Zoom, they're all making investments into what we call the hybrid workplace. And, you know, it will be um, for the foreseeable future, I think this model is going to be a mainstay in, in terms of hybrid work. So you might come into the office, you know, one or two days a week and then work remotely for the remainder uh, three days. Um, and then it also, you know, poses the challenge of how do you maintain employee satisfaction because now they're working, you know, anytime, all times you have access to, to employees. And there's no reason why an employee could say, well, I didn't see that message, you know, with, with Teams and Zoom, et cetera. Um, it's readily accessible from every device we carry. And so to answer your question, I think it's gonna, this, this model hybrid work will be around for the foreseeable future. So, um, and that has happened with PAXA also. Uh, oh, yeah. You tell me about your experience. I mean, the last time I looked, uh, you had something in the order of 80 staff. Maybe it's more or less now, depending. Um, have you increased staff and are they all at home or half of them are at home? How does that work? Yeah, so we, we've increased staff. We're upwards of about, I think, closer to 100 or 95 employees around that. You know, including our, our contractors and partners. But um, that said, as soon as the pandemic happened, we were already equipped to just work from home. And again, you know, I, I wouldn't have made a decision so quickly if I didn't really know and understand um, that Paxos systems and you know, customer facing information was secured and that we could do it in that way. So as of now, you know, PAXA is in a hybrid uh, work configuration where a majority of the staff is working from home and we have some people coming in and out as necessary. Um, we also have planned to take advantage of this time by um, reconfiguring our office space 
um, to have a technology innovation facility, uh, I'm sorry, a technology innovation and training facility built out of the space while everybody's working from home. Well, you know, in, in March, when we became aware, we, we, we were using first uh, Zoom way back when, way back when, like two yeah. or three years. Yeah. Uh, and then we used Skype for a while. And then our vMix uh, machine, our, that vMix uh, switching machine had a something called vMix Call, which uh, pretended to take place of all of that. But we ultimately got back on Zoom. So we watched Zoom carefully through COVID. And as everybody knows that Zoom has, uh, you know, done very dramatic things in terms of its customer base, in terms of its technology, its security, um, and its functionality in general. And every time you look, every new version, there are things that are better and better and better. Mm -hmm. um, and so you say, hmm, if things are better, then that offers greater functionality to the players in this hybrid new world. Okay, and, and it, what it means is that part of the hybrid, which is on, you know, remote video audio, um, could take a larger bite of the pie as we go forward, because you can do more, you share documents, photos, what have you, have meetings, uh, collaborate in every which way. And so my question to you, Kelly, is, is uh, do you think it's going there? Because hybrid suggests half-half. But I know that's not exactly right in any case, but um, is it moving? Is the dynamic to um, more of more of the pie going to you know virtual programs? Oh, oh, for ab absolutely, without a doubt. And we see the innovation around this technology in particular happening as we speak. I mean, there are, you know, you and I are probably just connected on our PCs or iPad or whatever have you, but there are systems being developed and that are already out to some degree where you can actually have these hybrid meetings, meaning there's two groups of people or multiple groups of people meeting in different spaces using this same technology. Um, and it's, it kind of has gotten so good that you feel like they're in the room right next to you, but they could be halfway across the world. So I really think, you know, this, it's going to be here to stay and that the innovation and the pace of innovation certainly won't stop. I mean, to your point, Jay, Zoom is rolling out new features seemingly every other week. And, you know, <clears throat> that, that kind of excites me because, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to force everybody to continue innovating um, in the spirit of competition. Well, it, it goes to another step too, doesn't it? Um, what it means is that, uh, you know, as you configured, reconfigured your office in the time of COVID, Mm -hmm. um, other people have too. Downtown landlords are, you know, wondering where all the tenants went um, because the tenants uh, have downsized their spaces and they're not necessarily coming back because they can do the same work and even more efficiently without all that space. I mean, this is a process that's been going on a long time. As technology advances, the need for large offices declines. And now it's going very quickly. And so I think it changes the real estate market, but it also changes, uh, what do you want to call it? The business efficiency market. And you probably see this among your clients. You can probably help to tune it. But if I'm, if I'm a client, a small business or a medium-sized business or even a large one, and I don't pay attention to these changes, um, I don't understand the way um, Zoom and other such programs have allowed me to bring my organization together, to network the ideas, the minds, the thinking, the innovation, the, you know, out of the box kind of thing, mm -hmm. um, then I am going to fall behind. And maybe it's okay if there was no competition, but there is competition. Yeah. <laughs> it, mm -hmm. means, it means I have a huge disadvantage. Are you seeing that process happen? Yeah, I, we do. Um, not, not as quickly as I think it's happening stateside and, and other larger, you know, geographies, but we certainly do see that happening. And I mean, in the, I would say in the near or midterm future, I mean, if you don't adopt, you know, if you don't innovate around what I mentioned earlier, you know, digital transformation, then I think you're probably going to be at a, at a big disadvantage or completely left behind. Yeah, one more point I'd like to cover with you, and that is, uh, you know, on your website, one of the most significant things you do is consult and manage IT for government, government. And uh, government is, you know, a 
big industry in our state, especially it's a big industry. And it's likely to stay that way. And, uh, you know, we should all be concerned that it be efficient and manage itself and be managed well. And so um, a few years ago, I'm sure you were following this, a fellow named Sonny Bagwalia was brought in by Neil uh, Abercrombie uh, to, do, to do an examination. He had been with GSA in Washington, knew a lot about computers, came in and, and did a, a big examination. It was, it was a public-private partnership funded, as I recall. Um, and it took a couple of years uh, for him to examine the state systems. I guess Abercrombie already knew the state systems were way behind. And this was confirmation of that because Sonny Bagwalia wrote this big report saying the state systems are way behind. Um, and, and he made recommendations, but I don't think those recommendations have been implemented. And I wonder if you could comment on where the government is, where the state government is, in terms of those or other recommendations to advance it and whether COVID has had an effect or should or will have an effect on bringing state government to a place where Abercrombie wanted it to be. I, I honestly I honestly see it, that it's getting there. I mean, credit to, to Sonny and what he you know, uh, found, uh, but PEXA has helped a lot of government agencies to modernize the infrastructure, to secure the infrastructure and we continue to do so today and I believe COVID has really, uh, you know, like any other organization, has um, uh, kind of forced a lot of agencies to look at hybrid work and the technologies behind enabling that concept. Um, so, yeah, I mean, to answer your question, you know, the successors have done a great job um, at the state to continue pushing the, the vision uh, for, you know, digital technology implementation at the state forward. And uh, we continue to see that trend not slowing down. I think it's it's accelerating. Um, Good. That's that's <laughs> actually comforting. Uh, one last question, and this sort of refers back to uh, my comments at the at the uh, front end of the show. Is is this? We, we all benefit by the development of a, of a tech industry here, and that and that comment has been in the air since John Burns. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. And every every governor has to some extent endorsed that, embraced that. Some have done more than others. Others have done nothing. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but the bottom line is um, it, it behooves us um, to diversify. It behooves us to have a, a very Akamai, increasingly a national Akamai level tech industry in Hawaii. And you're part of that. But I wonder if you could comment on how much progress we're making and how much progress we should be making in the future so as to be, be known as a place where um, we innovate and we do technology and we're just as good as any other place in the country. Yeah, I mean, to, to be <clears throat> honest, I, I have heard that before and I think we're making a lot of progress. Um, you know, PAXA has endeavored on creating a workforce development program that's meant to provide opportunity and we're talking about commodity opportunity for really anybody to get into technology. And like we talked about earlier on the show, Jay, you know, with what um, the defense market in Hawaii will be doing and, and the requirements for cybersecurity, there is going to be much opportunity now, I mean, even now and in the foreseeable future for technology implementation, consulting and um, engineering. Uh, for a while, for, for years to come here in Hawaii. Um, and so again, PAXA is really trying to take advantage um, of you know, the technologies that are emerging to help people get employ employment um, in Hawaii. And, and, and like you said, make us um, a strong player in the technology arena, you know, globally, if you, if you would. I, I think that's possible. Um, we're certainly not there yet, but we're trying, definitely trying to get there. <laughs> well, it strikes me that, uh, you know, there's a, a fair amount of uh, conversation going on about how we ought to expand our local agriculture and the, um, you know, the legislature ought to uh, do something to incentivize or require uh, the hotels and the hospitality industry to buy local agriculture. Uh, at the same time, to also follow through in some of those incentives that have been considered over the years uh, to develop the tech industry. And um, I'm, I'm hoping, I, I guess, you know, we're all hoping um, that that actually happens. 
because even though they would be your competitors, um, you would be in a critical mass of, uh, of IT knowledge. And it would help to uh, have, have other companies across the street that had the expertise that were in the same market. It would, uh, is it, you welcome that or is that something that troubles you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, Paxa cannot, technology means a million different things to a million different people. And so we certainly can't do it all and we certainly don't know it all. Um, so I, I definitely welcome having any kind of expertise built out of Hawaii, as long as, you know, it benefits the local community and helps develop a stronger workforce, especially in the, in the technology arena. Good for you. Uh, Kelly Uyoka, uh, President and CEO of PAXA, an important IT company in the state of Hawaii and a part of our future as we go forward into hopefully a more innovation economy. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you, Jay. Hello.